All right. Uh, I have <clears throat> a little preamble to go through before we get started, and I apologize for the delay. It's some technical members from one uh, technical issues with one member, but uh, we'll get started here. So this is the uh, May fourth, twenty twenty meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, we are being recorded, and this is being conducted by Zoom hearing. <clears throat> Such agenda item was advertised in accordance with the uh, updated open meeting law with uh, Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. All meeting materials and information have been provided to members of the public on the town website. Uh, we have been advised by the governor that this is an appropriate way to handle meetings <clears throat> going forward until a state of emergency is uh, ended. Uh, for this meeting, the ARB is convening via Zoom conference, as I noted, um, and it is being recorded, as I noted, for the moment, people will not be able to see you. Uh, I'm going to discuss that with other members of the board in just a, uh, just a minute. Uh, as we move through, I'll introduce each agenda item and the speaker on each agenda item. We only have uh, two this evening, one of which is uh, the ARB property update. Second is the open forum. There won't be any public comment necessarily on the ARB property update, but anyone who wishes to speak to that matter will be given time to do so during the open forum portion of the hearing. <clears throat> so, uh, what we'll do in accordance with our policies that have been put in place since we've been doing this is anyone, as anyone wishes to speak, I'll have you use the raise hand function on the Zoom uh, toolbar. Uh, when you raise your hand, uh, either I or Jenny will call on you virtually, uh, unmute your line, and give you the chance to speak. Uh, I'll have you introduce yourself. Give your name and address as you would in any normal public hearing so that we can identify you for uh, purposes of our own record keeping. Uh, and then let me know when you're finished so that we don't turn you off uh, <clears throat> automatically. We keep fo folks on mute just for purposes of keeping sound clean and clear, preventing people from talking over one another or outside chatter and side chatter coming in. Um, I want to make sure that all the members of the board and staff are here, so I'm going to run down a list of names uh, that they're in the room. Um, so I see we have uh, David Watson. Uh, yes, here. Ken Lau. Hi. Rachel Zamberry. Here. And Jean Benson. Jean, can you just let me know? I see your face, but can you just uh, I'm say? here. Okay, great. Thank you. And I think the, this evening we have only Jenny Raitt from staff. Yes, here. Okay. So um, <clears throat> the way these, these meetings, before we get into the 7 o'clock agenda item, I want to have a quick discussion about sort of how we've been proceeding through these meetings. Uh, <clears throat> following an, an incident during another public meeting, uh, it was advised – we had several options here uh, and decided not to allow speaker video. During these meetings, uh, following last week's meeting, two members of the board uh, approached me separately, individually, uh, and suggested that perhaps we allow for video to be turned on during uh, the time that that person was speaking. Uh, and I think that that probably makes sense at this point. <clears throat> that uh, when someone is to raise their hand during open forum or public comment period, for example, uh, that the host, which would be Jenny or myself, turns on their video when we unmute them and allows them to present. Uh, I think we can give people a pretty short leash if anything inappropriate is done. Uh, I would hope that people respect the rules of these meetings and treat them as they would if they were there in person. Uh, but I think that's probably a fair and equitable way for people to get their point uh, across. Um, you know, this is sort of a process of trial and error. It's a new way of doing business for public bodies. I know many of us have experience with doing this uh, in private industry and business, but uh, <clears throat> allowing members of the public to speak is certainly different than having a, uh, a Zoom meeting uh, in place of a conference call. So I hope that members of the public can be understanding of that. Uh, that this is not an attempt to shut people out. We've done everything we can to allow people to speak. Uh, we're just trying to manage this the best way that we can. Um, so I think that's the way that we're going to proceed unless any of the other board members have uh, an issue with that. Uh, 
All right, I'm going to take it that no one does. So that's the way we'll operate from here on out. Um, so moving into the seven o'clock uh, item, which is agenda item number one regarding the Central School Renovation Project update, uh, which is 23 Maple Street as well. <clears throat> so I'll turn it over to Jenny to walk us through that portion of the agenda. Great, thank you, Andrew. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the first part of this update is to just, uh, it's been a while since I mentioned the Central School Renovation Project, um, in part because we were on track to, uh, we had gone through the uh, bidding process, we had a, um, a contractor, and we were uh, then in a state of emergency. And so during and we were awaiting uh, issuance from the governor about how to how uh, construction could occur during COVID-19 and the precautions that are necessary for construction sites and contractors to abide by. Um, so we put everything actually on hold. We have been reviewing that. We've been talking with the contractor. Various councils have been discussing this. And um, I can now comfortably tell you that we are planning to issue a notice to proceed. Um, and since I know that some of the neighbors are actually on this in the meeting, um, I will be sending out a notice to the neighbors as I sent them back in uh, early March, actually, notifying them that the project was going to proceed. Um, we actually didn't have a, a firm start date at that point in time. At this moment, it appears that next Monday will be the notice to proceed date. And my best guess at this point is that they will be ramping up all during next week on site with the site, um, you know, sort of mo mobilization, which basically entails uh, fencing, proper signage, uh, following all of the um, site protocols, both externally and internally, because there are still tenants in the building for the most part. Um, so uh, my, uh, just as a reminder, the first part of the construction is actually happening on the second floor. It's a renovation project to uh, what were office suites for a um, sort of a, a school program. And that became vacant and we are having health and human services move upstairs. So the first thing that needs to happen is the renovation to that space, which should take about a month. And then the real construction project will begin in earnest on the ground floor and the first floor thereafter. Um, so that that's just a, Roughly, I wanted to give you the update and also just let you know that we are finally in a position to sign the contract and issue a notice per, to proceed, which we haven't been able to do uh, during, you know, at, at this point in time and uh, had planned to do early in March, but things obviously changed. I'm, I'm, I'll just pause there to see if you have any questions about the project. Uh, Jenny? Yes, Ken? Do you hear me? Yep. Um, what is the premium to proceed? Um, uh, with the protocol that we have to put in place to proceed now with the, epi with the epidemic going on right now? That's a really good question. And that was part of our reluctance to proceed. But we have, they've actually issued all of their protocols. The Health and Human Services Department has reviewed them and provided feedback. As part of the first change order, they will be providing us with the cost of how they will be able to abide by those rules. Um, so we don't yet have an exact price tag, but we have an estimate um, and we anticipate that it'll be about $20,000. So it'll be coming from our, our contingency budget. Um, and actually the permanent town building committee approves all of the change orders that are issued as part of the ongoing um, you know, uh, control over the project. I, I, the reason why I bring up that question is a couple of my projects are in Boston and um, they have a, uh, some projects have um, elected to um, postpone uh, the start of their projects until this, um, I guess you call it uh, extra procedures uh, are not required anymore. So we, so there's a savings. And uh, well, not a savings, but there's not an extra for that um, um, precautions of what we have to do. Um, but would you say that it's only a twenty thousand dollar ad for these proceedings, and that's including? I'm assuming um, that's like some sort of a check-in station where all the workers come in and check the temperatures, 
uh, daily with a affidavits uh, saying that they're not sick. Uh, extra wash stations and uh, cleaning procedures. That's all within that 20,000. There's actually many more parts to the protocol. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I realize that, but but, is, um, but, but that's all covered that's, in the that's, 20? That's what's covered under that first, that likely first change order. Um, but it doesn't necessarily cover things that might come in the future. Of course, there would be, there may be other things that happen in the future as part of any project. Um, but yes. All right, I'm I'm just you know just wondering if we thought uh, thought enough about you know maybe holding off for another six months uh, to see if um, uh, you know the protocol is relaxed a little bit based on uh, what the findings would be that there won't be such a, a large amount of money, but twenty thousand doesn't seem very much to me in the light of the whole contract as far as having a safety protocol in place, but if it if it if it gets up to like a hundred thousand, I think we should start looking at uh, delaying the project. That makes sense. I will say though that our, our local um, health department uh, is very interested in those protocols, and even I think if if something changes with the state, they may continue to have those protocols in place regardless to make sure that there's worker safety, and particularly if there's another um, if if things change and the pandemic continues work comes back with a resurgence. So they're very aware of the need to keep those safety measures in place. But I, I think it's a good point to consider the budget and, and of course, look at how much it actually would be continuing. We definitely have been talking about postponing or stopping the project completely. Um, in either one of those scenarios, it would have required us to completely redo the project and likely hire a new designer. So we would have had to go back to the beginning Okay, uh, I, I, it's just a question, Jane. I'm not. It's not. Yeah. Uh, hard and fast. You know, let's do this. You know. I will bring it back to the OPM and uh, bring that concern to him. Jenny, I, what are the cost implications of starting over? I, we would have to reissue. Well, you mean like in, at a future date? Yeah. Yeah. If we would have to reissue uh, an RFP for designer services and basically start the whole project over again. Um, we'd have to release the money that we've bonded, which is $7.8 million for the project, and, uh, re and get new funding in place to rehire a designer um, for the project. That, that's, that was the likely scenario of what would happen if we had to start over. I don't know what the total cost would be necessarily, but it cost us $400,000 to hire the designer originally and $200,000 for the um, OPM, the, the initial services. So. All right, so we'll, we'll keep moving forward <clears throat> there okay. unless, until anything changes. Certainly. And I'm glad to answer any other questions if there are others from people who are participating. Um, okay, so um, on 23 Maple Street, this is the this is actually the property next door. Um, and as you know, we've had a tenant in the property since about the early, early 2000 uh, time period. They have a lease that's ending at the end of at, in June, at the end of June. It's a property that's about 5,200 square feet of rentable space. We've been pulling in about $52,800 in annually in rent and the capital contribution. So it's actually our biggest paying, highest paying tenant in the portfolio, um, which is still only about $11 a square foot, um, but is uh, it's still pretty remarkable for the for the function of the Urban Renewal Fund. Um, it's uh, technically that's an R7, both the central school building and that building are zoned R7. So there's a lot of different types of uses that could technically go there, uh, including residential, different types of office spaces um, and uses. There's uh, technically there's 10 dedicated parking spaces for that uh, tenant, but the parcel itself is actually the entire uh, stretch of the driveway all the way at, that's adjacent to the town garden in the back of the property if you're familiar with it. So it's quite a large parcel um, in reality, but 
um, the rest of that parking is dedicated to either central school or even some of the, the neighbors who happen to have uh, property on the street on that uh, uh, driveway rather um, the uh, the next step basically is that I need to issue an RFP I was hoping to do that back in March <laughs> um, but again of course everything's been postponed um, and so now we want to come back to this and we need to put it out for an RFP um, as part of that we would uh, need one or two of you to participate um, in the past it's been just one person but of course if more than one of you would like to participate that'd be great um, with myself and Adam in uh, reviewing the proposals that we receive potentially interviewing the, um, the proponents and then of course uh, coming back to the board with a recommendation to sign a lease. Um, my best guess of the timeline would be that it'll be into July by the time we get this whole process completed. And I think that that's an ample amount of time, uh, but I also think that it's enough time to have the current tenant vacate and allow us to clean up the property so that it's ready for the next tenant and use. Um, so I guess I'll answer any questions, but also ask if any board member or members are interested in participating. Um, <clears throat> I, have, I have a few questions. What is okay. the state? Uh, what's the state of the current tenant given the pandemic? Can we presume that they're going to be moving out at the end of their lease? They're planning to move out at the end of the lease. And they have, and they have it, not communicated otherwise to you, given. No, no, their their lease is up, and they're they're planning to move out, and they will likely be, um, you know, will we after they move out, I'll be able to fully judge the condition of the property, um, and return any uh, any deposit. They have an original uh, security deposit on the property from two decades ago, um, and we'll take a look at at any of that. Do we well. have any any sense of what kind of condition <clears throat> the, the building is in beyond normal wear and tear? Um, not, not, nothing to communicate that would be new at this time, no. Um, our last time be at the property, it looked to be inside of the property. It looks to be in rel the same condition that it's been in, which is the typical wear and tear, but upkeep that's required to run um, the type of use that they run at the property. Um, as allowed by the state, it's it's monitored by the state technically, um, and I would guess that what, by the time I can send somebody back into the building to assess it, won't be for a number of weeks until um, we can safely perform a site visit. Um, this, this lease is up at the end of June, correct? Yes. All right. Um, all right. I'll turn it over to to David. Let's go down the list here. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, I don't. Kin. Um, what are we thinking of um, using that building for? Well, what do you think there might be, what people will be interested in using it for? My best sense is that it will be office uses proposed um, for the property, but I don't know. Um, I think we would. Um, probably say we would be open to enough. There are a number of different uses that are possible in the R7. Um, I don't think we would necessarily say retail, <laughs> but at the same time, if we had a particularly interesting proposal by say an artist uh, or uh, somebody who wanted to open up a studio and then also sell their work, um, that would be maybe interesting and might fit with the neighborhood. But I think it comes down to what will fit within the neighborhood and what would be, what would make for, you know, a good, a good uh, tenant for the town to be able to manage. Okay. And I think that as part of the RFP, we would ask for a management plan um, and also be very clear about expected upkeep and maintenance of the property. Um, are we looking for any sort of minimum rent in the RFP? I think I'd probably set that minimum rent at $11 a square foot since that's where we currently are. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, we've had other tenants in the, ne the neighboring building who pay less per square foot, but in order to keep the portfolio healthy, I think that would be the best outcome for the town. Jean or Rachel, did you have any questions? I do not. No. All right. Who would like to serve on the, uh, the RFP committee? 
don't everybody speak up at once. Um, I'm happy to happy to do it. <clears throat> I'll volunteer. Uh, my time is a little bit limited these days, but I think I can handle this. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. That, that's all that I had. Um, I just wanted to make sure the board was comfortable with that and would allow me to proceed. And then I've got to volunteer. Yeah, and as you know, just to remind, I know there are a lot of folks in the room <clears throat> who are interested in this property. Uh, as things move forward, uh, we will accept uh, your comment. And in fact, um, thinking this through, uh, Jenny, would it be wise to have uh, one person from one person from the the neighbors, the abutters, uh, join us in the RFP committee? Um, I think it would be great. Um, you know, we've developed a good relationship with the neighbors at this point. They're very interested in um, their neighborhood and what goes on in it and have a lot to share about that. And I think that could better inform. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that would be good as far as determining what's the best fit. Uh, I know there is a, a loose association of neighbors there. Uh, we've met with them in the past and they've been uh, yeah. very, very good to work with. So. Uh, to those of you on the line right now, I want to ask you to make a decision, but if you want to uh, communicate that through Jenny, uh, we'll keep you in the loop and add you to that list uh, as this is being formulated and decided upon. I'd like to, to have your involvement here to keep uh, to keep that neighborhood fit correct. You know, this, we, not something we can do in every uh, situation, but given the fact this is a town-owned property and uh, this board is its landlord, uh, I'm more than comfortable doing it here. And, saying that that's the case so um please let jenny know who you'd like to to nominate there we'll do that yeah. feel free to email me and also whenever the rfp if if you are on the line and you're not planning to participate if you want to review the rfp or you know follow any part of the process i'm also glad to share that information as well of course it would be once it's completed it will be posted and shared as uh, in the, our typical request for proposals process um, through our procurement process. But I'm glad to keep people engaged. Good, good. All right, uh, that's great. So moving on to section two. Andrew, do we need to take a vote on you serving on that committee? I yeah, was going to ask you, if you, could, if you could vote to both put, put out the RFP and then also have a participant on the review committee, I would appreciate that. Uh, well, let, let's vote to put, to appoint me to the committee first. So go ahead and do that. So moved. Uh, wait a second. Second. All right, so uh, David? Aye. Ken? Aye. Jean? Yes. Rachel? Aye. I'm an, uh, yes, obviously. Uh, should we hold off on <clears throat> putting out the RFP until one is drafted? Do we want to have some say in that uh, drafting, or do we want to just authorize uh, the department to go ahead and do that now? I'm fine with it. Okay. I mean, I'm I, just as long as the RFP uh, is is broad enough that uh, it would welcome. Uh, a variety of proposals. Um, I don't know that we necessarily need to review it though. Okay, I'm comfortable with that. So I think we would, uh, all right. So I'll take a motion to authorize the department to put out the RFP for 23 Maple Street. So motioned. Second. Second. All right, David? Yes. Ken? Aye. Rachel? Hi. Jean. Yes. Okay. I vote yes. So good. All right. Um, great. We'll talk about that in the future. Uh, and then we'll <clears throat> look forward to hearing from the neighbors as to who is going to assist us in that committee. Look forward to that. All right. Now we'll move into open forum. And uh, we had a request from Don Seltzer to have uh, something shared. So Jenny, if you could bring that up on the screen. Uh, Don, I'm going to call on you first. I'm going to uh, lower your hand, unmute you, and I'm going to start your uh, video as soon as I can find your name again here. Hi, uh, Don Seltzer, Irving Street.
Okay, Stone, go ahead. Okay, um, I'm looking for Let me the that. file. Jenny, do you have the file? I'm, I'm working on it. One, one, okay. 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 Uh, I'm going to be brief with this and get right to the heart of the matter. Uh, it has to do with the visualization of the Hotel Lexington that uh, was provided. Okay. It's on uh, the screen now. Yeah. Great. Um, I see. Thank okay. you. Um, this is the scene from Mass Ave um, coming from the West, supposedly. I had taken a closer look at this photo and found a number of irregularities. I've highlighted the location of several of them. Uh, the first thing to notice is that the Massachusetts Avenue curb down in that area uh, has a sudden discontinuity, suddenly jumping maybe 10 feet to the right. The next thing that came to my attention looking at it is that the telephone pole in that vicinity has a strange little bend to it. And then I began wondering about that low rise building in that same area with the very dark awning over it. And I'm going to get back to that one later. Can I have the next slide, please, Jenny? Thank you. This is the current view of Massachusetts Avenue there. And I'm going to use the telephone poles as a landmark sort of. So like, I see, uh, Don, just yes. did you take that picture or is that, uh, that, that's from Google Maps and it looks to me like it's dated 2017. That's right. Is this that is a Google Maps. With how it looks in 2020? Um, I don't think anything has changed appreciably. Certainly the utility poles um, are where they're shown here. Okay. And uh, later on, I'll, I'll be showing uh, an Arlington GIS uh, map of the area from overhead, which also shows the location of these telephone poles, which I'm using as landmarks. Uh, so if we can go on to the next one. We're back to the visualization provided. Um, we have pole A, which is in front of uh, what used to be Nicola's uh, Pizzeria. Pole B is on the corner of Clark Street. This marks the beginning of the lot under development. Pole C is just about exactly 50 feet away from that. And pole D down at the far end, that's another 110 feet down Mass Ave. And that marks the far end of the development lot. Um, if you look at this, it's pretty clear that the hotel and that low rise building I referred to earlier all fall between pole B and C. Uh, that's a distance of 50 feet. That strange building, I finally figured out, that's not an awning at all. That is the roof of the porch of the, build, of the gabled building right behind it, 1205 Mass Ave. What the small white low rise building is, I'm not sure. It seems to be a mashup of the DAV building and the leader bank building much further down the street. How they ended up combined together under the front porch roof of the 1205 Mass Ave, I do not know. Uh, the other thing to notice is that the building is supposed to be higher than the utility poles. That's not apparent in this view. Um, I guess we can go on to the last slide. Uh, this is the overhead view um, using um, the town GIS viewer. Uh, the poles are clearly marked out. Um, from pole, the, the yellow shows what the frontage of the hotel is as in that visualization. The red line shows the actual frontage of the hotel as shown on the plans. So I'll def uh, I have a couple questions for you. And certainly. I'll keep this going. Um, and I'll defer to Ken and Rachel here, who are the architects. Uh, certainly, I have some experience with plans myself. Have you cross-checked these photographs, photoshops, illustrative drawings with the plans themselves? And it, it looks like you have from this last view here. Are you asking me, um, Andrew? I'm asking you that. Oh, uh, 
well, that's why I went to the overhead view to to double check it. Yeah. Um, so I think you know. <clears throat> again, this is more of a question for for Rachel and Kin, but um, when when one is applying for a building permit, typically the building department will rely on the plans and not illustrative photos. I see Rachel nodding her head, but yes, that's that's correct. A lot of um, I mean, Photoshop is really in most cases a pretty imperfect <laughs> uh, science at best, and um, often subject to a lot of a lot of liberties um, by the by the person putting it yeah. together. So, Don, I, I appreciate uh, sort of understand where you're going with this. Uh, I think. It, Next, uh, our next meeting, which is May 18th, the, the developer is slated to actually participate uh, and be there. And I would suggest you bring this up with them at the time. Well, the one reason that. why I wanted to bring it up tonight was that first it was a very light schedule. And this would give time for you to maybe inquire of the developer about that visualization he provided. And he would be able to correct it in time for the next um, hearing on the 18th, which will yeah, obviously I mean, be a busy schedule. Understanding that these are, are illustrative, yeah, my concern is with the plans and how the building will actually be built. Yes. Um, I was prompted also by the fact that when that visualization was showed to the board back in January, several members of the board commented at the time and say, oh, gee, that looks really good. I, I didn't expect it to uh, fit in with the neighborhood so well. Sure. Um, so I just want to alert you that for whatever reason, that visualization is not terribly accurate and you shouldn't rely on it in making your judgments. Uh, we rely on the plans. <laughs> yes. Okay. The elevations. Yeah. The elevations. Yeah. Not just uh, poor, poorly drawn out photoshops, but uh, sure. certainly thank you. Okay. Anything else, Don? No, and thank you very much for pre presenting the okay. presentation on the screen for me. I appreciate it. That mute was an accident, not intentional. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Don. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Michael Ruderman, I'm going to bring you up. Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate your... Um, uh, revealing my video and and audio. I sent to the board a communication on Friday, the end of last week. I appreciate uh, Ms. Rate's confirmation of that. Uh, my communication was asking you why the board has adopted the policy that it has of concealing the images of participants in these meetings until the chair or someone else selects and decides to reveal them. I present to you my opinion that this is a prejudicial treatment of members of the public who, if they were attending this meeting in live space, as we have been for so many years previously, would be seen by the board and would see the board and see the other participants at the meeting. And I contend that muting and disguising or cloaking the images of participants is prejudicial to whatever it is that they may say or contribute to the meeting thereafter. My own opinion is that this is a very bad look for the board. It would seem to someone that you are attempting to limit the contact that the public has with the board, limit it not only in this age of pandemic, but limit it as to what we have come to expect people would be able to do and say and present were we meeting in real space in real time. Now, since this line about clo cloaking or covering the identity of the video of participants is in the agenda, it appears to me a board policy. The question that I emailed to you on Friday and asked for your response, for which I have yet received none, is why this policy has been adopted, why it is preferable to allowing full participation from members of the public, what is the risk, if any, of doing so, 
And at what time or place or meeting did the board decide to take up this policy? That's policy all. Discretion of the chair and we'll continue to review the policy as these meetings go forward. Uh, I disagree that anyone has been prejudiced. Anyone who wishes to speak may do so. May present material to the board ahead of time as Mr. Seltzer just has uh, and <clears throat> join in the meeting. Uh, I appreciate your, your comments, but uh, I respectfully disagree. I agree with you totally, um, Andrew. I think this is a living uh, process that we're going through. This is not something we've done before and we're, uh, we're, we're learning. And I think we're trying to do our best to be fair to everybody, but also uh, react to certain things that have happened. Um, I think at the ComCom um, uh, Zoom meeting, and I think, you know, we're, 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 that was never our intent to censor anybody. Uh, our intent was and to be fair to everybody. And I would say you know, no one has been censored. Anyone who wishes to speak is given the opportunity to do so. That is not my point, sir. My well, point <laughs> is that by not revealing or allowing me to be seen and to see the other participants in this meeting, you are placing my comments and whatever it is that I have to present now or in the future. The video is on. Your voice is on. We can see you and you can see us. You are putting you my comments at a lesser priority, a lesser believability, a lesser credibility of what anyone else might present. And I am saying this both for myself right now and for two weeks hence when you bring up uh, a matter that I will participate materially in of right. the property at 882, 892 Mass Ave, for which I am a board member of one of the businesses that has a lease at that property. I look forward to your comments and I will have you on camera and unmute your line at the time that it's appropriate. Thank you. Are you finished? I am not satisfied with your answer. That is all from me. That's your prerogative. Uh, Michael Quinn. Hi, good evening. Let me, uh, I'll start the video. Hang on. Uh -huh. Yep. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Quinn. I'm the uh, uh, board chair for the uh, Council on Aging. And um, the reason I'd come to this meeting was I saw on the agenda was that the Central School Renovation Project was on the list for tonight. Um, I very much appreciate getting the update on where things stand with that. Uh, I understand it's probably too soon to get a clear sense of uh, what we expect the overall delay to be, but certainly Ken Law, you gave me a little scare there with the six months. Um, I'm just, you know, the things will develop as they go. Um, I'm just gonna hope um, that while you guys prepare for all of the possibilities, that isn't where things wind up. Um, and just generally, if, um, if there are more updates going forward or if there's anything um, that uh, the Board of the Council on Aging can do um, to help smooth out this process as, you know, all of the council's programs are, are spread out, um, uh, we would certainly be, be willing and, and, and eager to do that. Uh, that's all I got. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Are there any other members of the uh, public that wish to speak at this time? Just use the raise hand function. All right, thank you. Thanks to everyone who participated. Don, thanks for uh, providing that document <clears throat> to, to Jenny and having that on the screen. Um, you know, this is, this is an ongoing process. It's not easy. Uh, personally, I find the way to, uh, <clears throat> the way that we're running meetings to be the most effective and efficient way of doing this and allowing us to conduct business uh, in a way that works for us as residents and the town. Uh, I understand that there are some people that disagree with that. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like Mr. Ruderman uh, left the meeting, uh, so he got his, his time in the sun. Uh, but <clears throat> this, is, this is an ongoing iterative, iterative process uh, that we will continue to look at uh, as, as we move through. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea is to continue to allow members of the public the chance to participate uh, and have their voices heard. Uh, these meetings are not the only way that that can be done. Uh, Seltzer frequently provides us with documentation. Uh, I know it's always thoroughly reviewed uh, and included in agenda items. I, I use him only as one example of many. Uh, certainly we are open uh, for business and therefore we are open to the public uh, to, to listen to them and uh, make the decisions as they come up. 
Uh, Gene, go ahead. No need to, for, for you to raise your hand. Okay, uh, just a couple of observations. One is I'm glad that we're able to see the actual person who's speaking. Um, I think that helps. I don't think there's a particular benefit in seeing the little video of everyone else who's not speaking other than the board and staff at that moment. And I, you know, on the size of the computer screen I have, I can't see all of the thumbnails at the same time. Anyhow, if we have more than about um, mm -hmm. eight, 16, you know, I keep moving the sliders, seeing the maximum number I can get. And realistically, when I'm at the board meeting, I'm looking at whoever's speaking. I'm not scanning the rest of the audience to see the reaction of anyone else in the audience. And people who are in the audience are looking at us. They're not turning around necessarily and looking at everyone else's head. So I think allowing um, the person who's speaking to use the to see a, see the person's face most closely approximates what happens during the meeting. You know, um, not to interrupt you, and I apologize for that, but I agree with you, and I think it actually puts more focus on the person who's speaking yeah. and the items that they're bringing up rather and, than standing up in, in the middle of a room where they may not even be heard, as we've experienced in the past. And as and the more that the more little thumbnails with videos, the more likely somebody's going to try to zoom bomb, and you might not see it right away. So. I think there are a lot of advantages to being able to see the one person who's speaking, but not others. I want to also turn to um, putting up on the screen um, materials that we've gotten um, in response to what's happening. I think it's great when we can see that when we've gotten the materials in advance and have had the time to look at them. And there are times when we've gotten the materials in advance and I've gone out to the sites to sort of ground truth it, to see if I sort of agree with um, what we've been given in advance as far as representations, whether it's from applicants or whether it's from public. I wouldn't think it's particularly helpful, at least for me, if the first time we're seeing something is on the screen at the meeting when I haven't had time to look at it in detail and think about it and potentially go out to the site to look at it. So I'd like to sort of have some consideration of making that distinction and making that known to the public going forward. Okay. Yeah, we can, we can continue to operate that way. That's a good idea, Jean. So uh, just typically I'm saying that the any comments or anything that's submitted to me is uh, can be submitted. It actually says it on the agenda uh, by uh, 12 o'clock the day of the meeting, um, which generally everybody is abided by at this point in time, which is it's actually pretty generous given that I don't normally I, I try to post everything by Thursday before the meeting, um, but I'm continuing to post content through noon. I can't really do it closer to the meeting, obviously, but um, is that, do you think that's too close to the meeting or? Well, yeah. for, for my, for my purposes, it is because if I want to have the opportunity to look at it, think about it, go out to the site, if it's the same day as the meeting, it's not always possible for me to be able to do that. So would you like to set a different timeline for when comments will be accepted by? Well, I mean, I think we can accept comments up until and including the meeting, but I just think in terms of having people share it on the screen, it's hard to do that. And, you know, again, if somebody shares it at, at the meeting in any way, I you can't really credit it without having some time to think about it and look at it. And I think that's the same reason we ask the applicants to provide the information far enough in advance of the meetings so we have the opportunity to spend some time with it and decide um, what to do about it. So I don't know, I'm interested in what other members of the board think about this. I, I would agree with Jean. I think that um, any any type of visual really needs to be looked at a little bit more more closely and it, and it is tough to, to do that um, when you see it for the first time 
in a, in a meeting? So I would say that the point, the point of open forum is for us, for, for members of the public to have an opportunity to bring things to our attention that are outside of the usual uh, <clears throat> meeting schedule. Uh, you know, for example, this evening, Don Seltzer brought uh, portions of the hotel or, or items relating to the hotel and, and did provide those to us ahead of time, um, but wished for a, a, an opportunity to speak ahead of a future agenda item. Um, you know, to the extent that, that people do wish to have something presented during open forum, uh, it's not really the purpose of the open forum. I think it's fair to allow it. Uh, <clears throat> and, and if people do wish to have something shown on screen ahead of time, um, you know, I do think it would be wise of us to ask for them to, to submit that even by Friday uh, to give us the weekend to go out and take a look. Um, but even, you know, with, with open forum, I think these are suggestions to, for us to keep in mind uh, and, not, and, and specifically not things to be acted on at a meeting. Yeah, I think that's a correct, important distinction. I was thinking more of items that were related to potential permits we would be issuing or app permit applications, and mm -hmm. it might be a little different for the open forum. So that I, that I do agree with, um, <clears throat> and I think that it would be fair for people to ask people to submit things ahead of time for items uh, like that, that may be on the agenda, A, to give the board the opportunity to review it and question the applicant, uh, but B, to, uh, in some of these public hearings that I expect to be larger than the, the two or three that we've had so far, uh, it creates for a more organized public comment period where I know in advance that there are a handful of people who will want to be called on to speak uh, and to be sure that I can uh, get their materials on the screen. Uh, Jenny can get their materials on the screen and I can give them the opportunity to speak early in the, uh, the process. So I think, um, you know, that situation, if we set a deadline of Friday at noon or, um, Jenny, would it have to be earlier than that since technically the, the, Town offices close at noon, although I know that things are sort of fluid these days. So when people are actually working. I think right now, Friday at noon is fine. Okay. I'm more concerned about people who, um, you know, we post our agenda basically 4 p.m., usually by 4 p.m. on Thursday. If mm -hmm. you are not really up to speed with information happening with the redevelopment board, and then you, you feel like you missed the boat for submitting something in writing. I, that's kind of why I like having it at least through Monday, which is pretty generous, and then also expects that one of my staff have to be available to upload the documents right away. But I, but I feel like that's why I like to have it through the day of the meeting, because I'm often getting emails over the weekend, um, you know, sometimes asking questions about things, not necessarily to post things, but people are... Um, just receiving the agenda. So they might not even be aware of it um, until Saturday sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess I'm, I understand what your point is though and, and that you want a reasonable amount of time to digest information. Um, it feels I, I, that that's an unusual circumstance though where most of the material is a letter or you know, verbal comments that are then often spoken at the meeting sometimes in fact. Mm -hmm. um, in duplicate. So rarely do you have something submitted that's visual that would require some sort of in-field sort of look, uh, you know, review. Yeah, beyond, yeah. The, beyond the plans that are given to us. And we've, we've uh, I think we've <clears throat> gotten people to submit us plans for the most part on time uh, so that they're published to everyone uh, and not just handed to us at a meeting. It's uh, difficult when that happens. Well, you know, I, I don't want to prevent anyone from coming to the meeting and saying something we haven't heard before or, you know, that they haven't submitted writing before because they have a certain absolute right to be able to come at the meeting and, and say what they want about the particular project. But I think it's different when they're presenting a visualization where we don't really have the opportunity, as I said before, to take a look at it, to consider it, to ground truth it, 
things like that. I've looked, you know, when we've had time before, and it's often because the hearings have gotten continued. I've gone out after the hearing's been continued before the next one and taken a look at the site and come away with a different impression than I got from just looking at the visualizations that had been presented to us, both the ones that the developers have presented, but occasionally ones that we've gotten from the public also. So we lose that ability if people are showing the visualizations for the very first time when we're going into the meeting or at the meeting. Well, the alternative would be, well, there's one one other way to do it is if you have, if we say that you would like to share a visualization, we would like to receive it by Friday at noon. Um, and that all other comments can be received up until, you know, Monday at noon to be posted. I mean, comments can be received in general, but these are to post, that's what we're talking about. This is limited to posting, by the way. Um, so I, think, I, think, I think that's a good distillation. I think that's probably the best way to separate them. Um, but also I would say that people can share things visually at a meeting if they want it to, and you can take it under advisement um, to later ground truth that if you feel that that's necessary in order to foster better dialogue or continue the conversation to the next hearing, which often happens. But I think I, I, can, I can make that change. All right. Okay. We should do that. Does that... Um, are, are, are we all amenable to that? Yes. Change? Is that clear? If you have a visual document you want to share with the board, we need to receive it by Friday at noon. All other comments related to material on the agenda for posting must be received by Monday at noon. Does that yeah. seem reasonable? Okay. All right. That works for you, Jenny. Works for me. Yeah, I, I think that's fine uh, as long as... Uh, uh, we get additional notice that something has been added since the agenda was issued. Well, usually what's happening is most people are emailing me and all of you. <laughs> yeah. um, that does. So we have. Generally speaking, what happens is right after I receive that email, I may not always respond to the person. It might be a, a little gap in time, depending, but I immediately forward that to my assistant who posts the material pretty much within an hour. I noticed it's a very quick turnaround. Um, so that that's generally what's happening. But if I happen to notice that you're not on the email, I will certainly bring that to your attention. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jean, Jenny, Rachel, for, for bringing that up. Um, all right. I still see some folks in the room. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak before uh, I hear a motion to adjourn? Raise your hand. All right. As always, feel free to email us. <clears throat> um, all right. I think that's, that's okay. all we have unless anyone I'll, has anything else. I'll just say I apologize for being a few minutes late. For some reason, Zoom didn't let me in until I actually created a Zoom account. And that's how I got in. So I'm not sure why that happened. But. Huh. All right. All right. Good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion by Ken. Second. Second by David. David? Yes. Do you want to keep us here all night or are you done? What? I don't think we heard you. We didn't hear you. We didn't hear you. We froze for a minute. No. Kin. Aye. Jean. Yes. Rachel. Aye. I vote yes. We are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thank Appreciate you. Thank you.